it is time for us to adopt a new company brand to encompass everything that we do. To reflect who we are and what we hope to build, I am proud to announce that starting today, our company is now a Black Mirror. Well, this week started with the promise ban on students having cell phones at Houston ISD's Madison High School. And we do have Fox 26's Tom Ziska live at Madison tonight, where students were not shy about expressing their displeasure on this ban. Tom. They were not. This announcement came last week. Students had a whole weekend to get worked up over the issue. The Whether you love it or hate it, the cell phones are really an extension of a young person's life. And in part, that's what the district is trying to address. Instead of heading to class, dozens of students streamed out of Madison High School in protest. On site, a notable police presence to observe and make sure nothing got out of hand. The phone ban, say students, is the latest effort to control them. Natalie Lopez says she's got her parents' support. Did you turn it in at all today? No, sir. I walked away from admin and told them that they had no right to take my phone or anything that belongs to me. <laughs> The school administration says the ban is a reaction to several fights on campus related to cell phone use. Students say it was because social media messaging got out of hand. Taking, a, taking away everybody's phone in the beginning of the day in the morning, but for, for what? Because you can't keep your school under control and you don't have the right amount of security. Um, this is not a protest for cell phones. This is a protest because we are being micromanaged. But this student, who would only identify herself as a senior, says there's more to it and the ban is just the last straw that they can't imagine being without. We're based on technology. What do you want us to do? We literally were on technology for quarantine for I don't know how many years, and how can you strip that away from us? Of course, it's gonna be alarming to students. Our constitutional journey did not stop then, and it must not stop now, Judge. And we'll be faced with equally consequential decisions in the 21st century. Can a microscopic tag be implanted in a person's body to track his every movement. There's actual discussion about that. You will rule on that. Mark my words before your tenure is over. Number eight, we will finally complete the biometric entry exit visa tracking system, which we need desperately. In my administration, we will ensure that this system is in place. And I will tell you, it will be on land, it will be on sea, it will be in air, we will have a proper tracking system. There is a revolution coming. Excuse me? What do you mean? The future is staring back at us, like a perfect picture on glass. And this future, it must be protected. <laughs> What's it got to do with me? Look. What is it? It will change everything. That's why they want to stop it. They will come after you without cease. Because the future belongs to us. Can brain scans be used to determine whether a person is inclined toward criminality or violent behavior? You will rule on that. Many tyrants and governments wanted to do it but nobody understood biology well enough, and nobody had enough computing power and data to hack millions of people. Neither the Gestapo nor the KGB could do it. But soon, at least some corporations and governments will be able to systematically hack all the people. Andy Justin tested positive. Let's do a Q test. Okay. Whoa. What is that? Who is this new device? I'm Q, and I'm here to protect the family. Hey, that's my job. I'm a smart home testing lab. I'm fast and super accurate. Please be negative. Don't worry, I got this. Whoa! Shh, they're coming. Yes! We're really warming up to you, Q. Just wait till you see what else I can do. Sponsored by 
Pfizer. This is really fascinating stuff. What you're looking at right now is a paralyzed man using his mind in order to create the words that appear on the screen. This revolutionary speech neuroprosthesis research at the University of California, San Francisco, is allowing the gentleman to communicate in complete sentences by translating signals from his brain to the vocal tract and directly onto text on the screen. It's one of several massive leaps in brain science technology that is literally creating a future of potentially infinite possibilities and also concerns about how this technology could be used or misused. Organic, intuitive, fluid. Neuromorphic computing is designed to work less like today's microprocessors and more like the human mind. Because brains are so different than transistor circuits, we have to rethink everything we know about computer architecture. Traditional microprocessors are synchronous, meaning every function is governed by a clock. The clock says when instructions are executed and when functions happen. Everything works in unison, according to the clock. Our brains are different. They're asynchronous, meaning no internal clock. Neurons operate with no prescribed order. We just have thoughts. Thoughts that build on each other or split off into different ideas. That's the way neuromorphic computing works too. It's completely asynchronous. So functions and instructions happen when they happen in parallel, which means neuromorphic systems think more like brains do. They can adapt, recognize nuances, and teach themselves as they work. It's an elegant, organic, and beautiful way to think. Meet Sally. Hello, what can I do for you today? The help you've always wanted. She is faster, stronger, more capable than ever before. Sally is part of your family, a teacher, a helper, a friend. New generation persona synthetics closer to humans than ever before. The other book that I really enjoyed, uh, a book by an Israeli author, uh, Yuval Harari, called Sapiens. And uh, it, it's a sweeping history of the human race uh, from 40,000 feet. Uh, and part of what makes it so interesting and provocative is that uh, because it's such a condensed, sweeping history. Um, it talks about uh, some core things that uh, have allowed us to build this extraordinary civilization. Uh, LG OLED, a perfect picture of Mars. Who are you? Oh, come now. I've already told you. The future is staring back at you. And I have to say, um, when I mention our names, like Mrs. Merkel, um, even uh, Vladimir Putin and so on, they all have been young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. But um, what we are very proud of now, the young generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Pres of uh, Argentina and so on, that we penetrate the cabinets. So yesterday I was at a, rece at a reception for Prime Minister Trudeau and I know that half of this cabinet or even more half of, uh, half of this cabinet are for our uh, actually young global leaders of the world economy right. form. We humans should get used to the idea that we are no longer mysterious souls. We are now hackable animals. Data might enable human elites to do something even more radical than just build digital dictatorships. By hacking organisms, Elites may gain the power to re-engineer the future of life itself. Because once you can hack something, you can usually also engineer it. And if indeed we succeed in hacking and engineering life, this will be not just the greatest revolution in the history of humanity, 
This will be the greatest revolution in biology since the very beginning of life, four billion years ago. For four billion years, nothing fundamental changed in the basic rules of the game of life. All of life, for four billion years, dinosaurs, amoebas, tomatoes, humans, all of life was subject to the laws of natural selection and to the laws of organic biochemistry. But this is now about to change. Science is replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design. Not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds, but our intelligent design and the intelligent design of our clouds, the IBM cloud, the Microsoft cloud, these are the new driving forces of evolution. And at the same time, science may enable life after being confined to, for four billion years to the limited realm of organic compounds, science may ena enable life to break out into the inorganic realm. So after four billion years of organic life shaped by natural selection, we are entering the era of inorganic life shaped by intelligent design. So does the data about my DNA my brain, my body, my life, does it belong to me or to some corporation or to the government or perhaps to the human collective? Humans are now hackable animals. You know, the, the whole idea that humans have, you know, this, they, they have this soul or spirit and they have free will and nobody knows what's happening inside me. So whatever I choose, whether in the election, or whether in the supermarket this is my free will, that's over. While some students clearly enjoyed the freedom of having their say, others say this needs to be the start of a conversation, not just about cell phones, but about keeping the peace at school. Like, and we are the voices because the teachers can't say much, the parents can't do much, so if we don't make the change, if we can't be the voice, then who will? Free will, that's over. That's over. Over. Today, we have the technology to hack human beings on a massive scale. Yeah, I mean, everything is being digitalized. Everything is being monitored. In this time of crisis, you have to follow science. It's often said that you should never allow a good crisis to go to waste. What you've just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. Samsung Electronics, a world leader in advanced semiconductor technology, today shared a new insight that takes the world a step closer to realizing neuromorphic chips that can better mimic the brain. Envisioned by the leading engineers and scholars from Samsung and Harvard University, the insight was published as a perspective paper titled Neuromorphic Electronics Based on Copying and Pasting the Brain by Nature Electronics. Tun Hee Ham, fellow of Samsung Advanced Institute of Technology and professor of Harvard University, Professor Hongan Park of Harvard University, Song Woo Hwang, President and CEO of Samsung SDS and former head of SAIT, and Kinam Kim, Vice Chairman and CEO of Samsung Electronics, are the co-corresponding authors. The essence of the vision put forward by the authors is best summed up by the two words, copy and paste. The paper suggests a way to copy the brain's neuronal connection map using a breakthrough nanoelectrode array developed by Dr. Ham and Dr. Park, and to paste this map onto a high-density three-dimensional network of solid-state memories, the technology for which Samsung has been a world leader. Through this copy-and-paste approach, the authors envision to create a memory chip that approximates the unique computing traits of the brain, low power, facile learning, adaptation to environment, and even autonomy and cognition that have been beyond the reach of current technology. The brain is made up of a large number of neurons, and their wiring map is responsible for the brain's functions. Thus, the knowledge of the map is the key to reverse engineering the brain. 
While the original goal of neuromorphic engineering launched in the 1980s was to mimic such structure and function of the neuronal networks on a silicon chip, it proved difficult because, even until now, little is known of how the large number of neurons are wired together to create the brain's higher functions. Thus, the goal of neuromorphic engineering has been eased to designing a chip inspired by the brain rather than rigorously mimicking it. This paper suggests a way to return to the original neuromorphic goal of the brain reverse engineering. The nanoelectrode array can effectively enter a large number of neurons so it can record their electrical signals with high sensitivity. These massively parallel intracellular recordings inform the neuronal wiring map indicating where neurons connect with one another and how strong these connections are. Hence, from these telltale recordings, the neuronal wiring map can be extracted or copied. The copied neuronal map can then be pasted to a network of non-volatile memories, such as commercial flash memories that are used in our everyday life in solid-state drives, or new memories such as resistive random access memories, by programming each memory so that its conductance represents the strength of each neuronal connection in the copied map. The paper takes a step further and suggests a strategy to rapidly paste the neuronal wiring map onto a memory network. A network of specially engineered non-volatile memories can learn and express the neuronal connection map when directly driven by the intracellularly recorded signals. This is a scheme that directly downloads the brain's neuronal connection map onto the memory chip. Since the human brain has an estimated 100 billion or so neurons and a thousand or so times more synaptic connections, the ultimate neuromorphic chip will require a hundred trillion or so memories. Integrating such vast number of memories on a single chip would be made possible by 3D integration of memories, the technology led by Samsung that opened up a new era for memory industry. Leveraging its leading experience in chip manufacturing, Samsung is planning to continue its research into neuromorphic engineering in order to extend Samsung's leadership in the field of next-generation AI semiconductors. The vision we present is highly ambitious, said Dr. Hum. But working towards such a heroic goal will push the boundaries of machine intelligence, neuroscience, and semiconductor technology. Hey, and welcome to Connect. Today, we're going to talk about the metaverse, starting with the most important experience of all, connecting with people. Imagine you put on your glasses or headset and you're instantly in your home space. It has parts of your physical home recreated virtually. It has things that are only possible virtually. And it has an incredibly inspiring view of whatever you find most beautiful. Now, lots of things that are physical today, like screens, will just be able to be holograms in the future. One part of this is Horizon Home, which is our early vision for a home space in the metaverse. Horizon Home is the first thing that you'll see when you put on your Quest headset. Today, there are already a bunch of options to choose from, and in the future, anyone will be able to create one. We've just called it home until now because it's been missing something very important. People. Soon, we're going to be introducing a social version of home, where you can invite your friends to join you as avatars. You'll be able to hang out, watch videos together, and jump into apps together. Over the last year and a half, a lot of us who work in offices have gone remote. And while I miss seeing the people I work with, I think remote work is here to stay for a lot of people. So we're going to need better tools to work together. Let's take a look at what working in the metaverse will be like. Imagine if you could be at the office without the commute. You would still have that sense of presence, shared physical space, those chance interactions that make your day all accessible from anywhere. Now imagine 
that you have your perfect work setup and you can actually do more than you could in your regular work setup. And on top of all that, you can keep wearing your favorite sweatpants. Black Mirror is still one of the best sci-fi series of our time. Considering that we are moving by leaps and bounds into a world that cannot be imagined, I wonder which of its pilots have already become, or will soon become, reality. Watch the first part of the technology breakdown from Black Mirror. Here we go. One of the best and simultaneously creepy episodes of Season 4 was Archangel, a technical thriller about parenting and parental paranoia. When a little girl disappears briefly into the playground, her mother decides to implant her with a chip that allows her to see and hear the same things as her daughter through a special app. It also gives the mother access to the girl's biometric data and allows real-time editing of images and sounds around the child that seem inappropriate to the mother. Brain implants are being developed by probably a dozen companies today, but the best known of these are Elon Musk's Neuralink and Synchron, which just recently received permission to test its technology on humans. The Stentrode chip, smaller than a matchstick, will allow paralyzed patients to control electronic devices by guiding cursors and activating other controls within their minds. A thin wire will connect the implant to another, located in the chest, and an integrated transmitter will broadcast the signal outside the body to a computer near the patient. Recently, Korean scientists announced the development of a brain implant that allows control of the brain via a smartphone. The tiny device made of biocompatible materials is equipped with an antenna to collect electromagnetic radiation, which is converted into electrical energy, allowing it to be charged wirelessly. The implant also has an energy-efficient Bluetooth chip and two micron-sized LED light sources on the thinnest probes. The LEDs are injected into a given area of the brain and flashed to make the right neurons respond to commands from the smartphone. It is assumed that the device will be able to block, for example, the development of neurodegenerative diseases. China has also unveiled its first wireless brain-computer interface, which allows the transfer of data between chips and nerve cells. It is reported to be cheaper than its foreign counterparts, designed only for animals, and will hit the market as early as September this year. But it is not only possible to monitor humans with a neural interface. For example, Alphabet, the parent company of Google, is working on computers that can be worn like contact lenses. With them, it will surely be possible to see and hear the same things as the wearer, as well as to transmit augmented reality images into his field of vision. We also already have wearable devices that track vital signs and apps that allow us to track a child's location, listen to their surroundings, and see their smartphone screen. All that's left to do is combine it all into one gadget. A futuristic development of the idea of a neural interface was the Crocodile series, in which the system can connect anyone to a machine to see their subjective memories of any moment from the past stored on the hard drive that is our brain. How feasible is this? Let us know down in the comments. The Pentagon is already working on memory recovery technology for people with neurodegenerative disease and brain injuries, but they're supposed to help people remember their memories, not broadcast them to a TV screen. A working prototype of the Black Mirror device is probably decades away, if it ever appears at all. However, there are several wearable devices today that allow us to record snippets of our own lives. For example, Snap Incorporated Glasses, which can record 10 seconds of video, or Samsung Contact Lenses, which can take a photo every time you blink. The technology giant patented them back in 2016, but since then there has been no news about them. But in 2019, Samsung received a patent for augmented reality contact lenses. According to the idea of the inventors, the lens can contain a display, a camera, a capacitor as a power source, a motion sensor, control units, and communication with an external device. An external device, such as a smartphone, could include a program that interacts with the contact lenses. Theoretically, such a device could in the future both record information to an external source and censor what the user sees by changing the desired areas. However, the same Elon Musk and other developers and futurists believe that sooner or later we'll be able to download our consciousness into the computer, and then the machine will receive not only our memories, but also our way of thinking, and perhaps the will. Such a plot is realized in Season 5 of Black Mirror, in the episode Rachel, Jack, and Ashley 2, where a robot doll with a loaded consciousness of a pop star, exploited by her own aunt, saves her human prototype by enlisting the support of other humans. Except that the doll first wants to kill the singer, who has fallen into a coma. 
claiming that this is a choice the pop star herself would have made. An even more frightening perspective on the use of Loaded Mind is shown in Episode 6 of Season 4, The Black Museum. One episode of the series shows the fate of a human consciousness trapped in the body of a teddy bear with a limited choice of voice commands. And in the second, the consciousness of an executed prisoner is preserved for the entertainment of tourists who may execute him again day after day. The prospects are terrifying, aren't they? But how realistic is such technology? As of today, scientists don't even have an exact answer as to what consciousness is and how it works. Can it be transferred to a computer? So far, such technologies are not even in the pipeline, but there are attempts to create a digital copy of a human being. In a heartbreaking episode of the second season of Be Right Back, a woman replaces her dead boyfriend with a synthetic counterpart using his online history, social media, photos, and videos. At first, she just chats with him online. They talk on the phone. And finally, the real version lives with her and helps her raise her daughter. But as always on the series, nothing good comes of it. However, this is the first technology that can almost be realized. Technology for creating humanoid robots has advanced quite a bit. Not only Hiroshi Ishiguru, but also Hanson Robotics and Promobot are creating them. On the other hand, Microsoft not so long ago patented a technology for creating digital copies of people, including the dead, using samples of their voice, photos, videos, and communication style in social networks. All the information goes into the system with elements of artificial intelligence and helps to copy his manner of communication. Microsoft already has programs that can communicate with people. For example, the chatbot Shaois, which imitates a 17-year-old girl. The bot can send emojis, express sympathy, and ask questions. The program also remembers the context of the conversation. Last year, a mother in South Korea was able to see her dead daughter again. Developers created a digital replica of the girl, which her mother was able to communicate with by wearing a VR helmet and tactile gloves. The engineers used real photos and videos of the girl, as well as a recording of her voice, to reproduce them in virtual reality. They also had help from a little actress who gave the VR model her movements. And the other day, NVIDIA replaced the CEO at its presentation with a digital replica and no one noticed. The copy appeared for only 14 seconds of the CEO's speech. NVIDIA said about it in its blog after the presentation, without revealing at what point the substitution took place. So, the company has demonstrated the potential of its platform Omniverse. To create a clone, specialists had to scan Jensen's body, as well as teach the neural network to copy his gestures and facial expressions. Bong himself voiced his 3D copy. So, in general, creating digital copies of people is not a problem. They can even imitate human communication, but unfortunately cannot possess his consciousness. However, even such a copy can be enough for identity theft by hackers. I do think there's reasons to be anxious about the potential of AI. There are these objects in our homes, computers and mobile phones. We don't really understand them. We don't really understand how they work. So HISD already has a no cell phone use policy. You can't even see the devices during the day, at least not supposed to. The only exception is during the lunch hour in the cafeteria. That is not the case here at Madison. The school administration cut that down because there were too many videos of fights in the cafeteria. And we don't know what they know about us. They seem to know quite a lot about us and we don't know much about them. My name is Alex Garland and my background is writing really and I, I see myself as a writer but I was also uh, directing this film, uh, Ex Machina. It's about a young guy who wins a competition within his company which is a, a big tech company. How long until we get to his estate? We've been flying over his estate for the past two hours. He wins a competition to spend a week with the CEO in the guy's mountain retreat. It's good to meet you, Nathan. It's good to meet you too, Caleb. When he arrives, he finds out that he's actually there to test Nathan's newest invention, which is a robot. 
that may have artificial intelligence, that may be self-aware. He's there to, to give her a Turing test to find out if she indeed is conscious. It comes down to if a machine can convince you that it has consciousness, then it has consciousness. The CEO is kind of threatening and predatory and we're not really invited to sympathize with him. But the film is ambiguous about whether he is actually like that or for the purposes of the test is, is pretending to be like that so that this young guy will cast himself as a kind of savior. Why me? Caleb, you have to help me. I'm 44 and my life has broadly kept pace with the development of home computers and video games, really. When I was, I guess, around 12, 13, something like that, I, I had a home computer. You could make the computer do very simple things. You'd say, hello, and it would say, hello, back. And you'd say, how are you? And it would say, I'm fine, how are you? And so you'd have this strange sense where, where the computer would suddenly have this slightly electric quality of, of being sentient. Of course, it's not sentient. You knew it wasn't sentient because you coded it. Still, the feeling it gave you was kind of special. But then in my adult life, I got quite interested in the relationship between AI and consciousness, our consciousness. If Apple suddenly pulled back a curtain and said, look what we've done, and this robot, Ava, stepped out from the shadows, we'd be surprised, but we wouldn't be that surprised. We, we kind of expect it's going on. So in that respect, automatically, it feels like it's 10 minutes in the future as opposed to 100 years in the future. We're all dreamers to a certain extent. The idea of what we're capable of is an incredible source of excitement and nervousness as well, because I think the past has shown us that often we lose control over the things that we create. Hello. Hi. There is explicitly anxiety about AI. Stephen Hawkins recently made a very clear statement stating that. You could draw a parallel with nuclear power. There's reasons to be nervous about nuclear power too, but that doesn't necessarily mean you don't use it. It's not innately bad. Our conversations are one-sided. You ask circumspect questions and study my responses. If it's one thing that at least with all the characters of, you know, that I've taking on is the fact that I can relate to them being human and that I can do with this part. So in one way I was just left with a blank sheet of, you know, I need to kind of figure out what this Ava is. So it happens that Alicia's trained as a ballerina so she has a kind of supernatural control over her physicality. If I actually just move my arm, like it's me, I can, I can move my arm, but if I do everything in a very precise way. It, 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 you know, it's something that any girl can do, but it's the awareness of it that has just become a bit too much that makes people question it. What she does is she does the uncanny valley with her physical behavior, her actions and uh, emotions. So there's nothing obviously robotic about the way she moves. In a way, what she does is perfect versions of what we do. Whereas I slouch on this chair and, and if I was to get up, I'd have to sort of, you know, displace my weight in a particular kind of way. She would rise off this chair with an elegance that I can't do. Now open your eyes. Are you attracted to me? I hope you are. The trick that happens in the film is that people don't spend enough time thinking about what's going on in her mind because they're, they're blinded and distracted by some of her uh, other characteristics. Did you program her to flirt with me? I programmed her to be heterosexual, just like you were programmed to be heterosexual. Nobody programmed me to be straight. You decided to be straight? Please, of course you were programmed by nature or nurture or both. And to be honest, Caleb, you're starting to annoy me now because this is your insecurity talking. This is not your intellect. Nathan is quite misanthropic. I don't think he values humanity very much. He knows that sooner or later, one of these robots is gonna escape and it's gonna be the end of us. And why shouldn't it be? So there's a little bit of a, of a suicidal aspect to what he's doing. And I, and I, think, I think he's okay with that. I wanted him to be someone who you often thought, you felt, was being unreasonable in what he said and did. And sometimes if you listen carefully to what he's saying, it might not be a, a comfortable truth, but it may still be a truth. 
And conversely, the other character, Caleb, often sounds like he's being reasonable, but what he's saying may not stand up to really close inspection. Caleb, you're wrong. Wrong about what? Nathan, you shouldn't trust anything he says. There's a bunch of games being played in a narrative sense about who you trust, why you trust them, what they're really doing. Everybody's lying to everybody else, all of them. Caleb, there's something I want to show you. Can we talk about the lies you've been spinning me? What lies? Do you want to be my friend? Of course. Did you know that Nathan brought me here to test you? It's very rare that you get to, to play a character in a film where the action scenes are dialogue scenes. Um, you know, the, the firework moments are these incredible situations where these people are torturing each other with their brains. Self-awareness, manipulation, sexuality. Are you attracted to me? Now, if that isn't true AI, what is? The film is definitely not supposed to be a cautionary tale about AIs. The caution is all aimed at the humans, from my point of view. My anxieties are about people, not machines. AIs might be more reasonable about some stuff than we are. We know what humans are able to do, all the bad things that we've done with technology, but if we actually can make something that has a conscience, why can it be one that is better than ours? The way she's shot, the music that plays, the film is definitely on the side of, of Ava, um, which is interesting. I was kind of infatuated with the robot. And I can see that when I watch the film. The love story for me is between me and the robot. Good morning, darling. I hope you had a good sleep. Please hold still for retinal scan. Would you like your shower now, Darwin? Resident KR201 is asleep. Hi, Mom. I wish you were awake. I really need to talk to you. Air purification is offline, and Paul is shutting down. You have no right to do this! Goodbye, Calvin. Who are you? You talk? We have to be cautious. We have to stay out of sight. If you want to go and see your mother, no one's going to stop you. He's going to bring them here. They're going to come looking for him, and they're going to find us. No! Are you sure we're safe out here? And here it is, the greatest advance in television since color television itself. See all color shows in living color. Once you've adjusted fine tuning for each channel. So there we see that it means that you can subdue a people, you can control a people by secret influence. That goes on to say under charm, to subdue by secret power, especially by that which pleases and delights the mind. So under charm there it says power to subdue opposition and gain the affection. But remember in the story of Wizard of Oz, how the Wicked Witch was having difficulty subduing her opponent. And finally she said, <laughs> I know what I shall do. I take this crystal ball. <laughs> she spreads her hands across the crystal ball and she creates a lovely poppy field. <laughs> oh, so beautiful. And Dorothy, the lion, the scarecrow, the tin man, going across this lovely 
coffee field fall to what? Sleep. Is it possible that I that's not just story? Is it possible that the crystal ball sits in the living room of every home practically in America? The beginning of the actual development of televisions began in 1928 in the USA. This was the octagon made by General Electric and operated using a mechanical rotating disc technology to display images on the screen. The TV was very large, had a 3-inch screen, and was just a prototype. A year later, the Baird TV was made. The first TV sold commercially. It was made in England and about 1,000 pieces were produced and sold for about 26 pounds, a fairly large amount at the time. The TV also used reflective light to create a tiny image. By the 1930s, mechanical television seemed to be outdated, so the electric TV was quite popular because it offered images with better resolution and was easier to produce. Thus, in 1936, the Emmy Visor model was produced which used a mean camera, had an image tube with a diameter of 4 inches and a magnifying lens that was used to increase the size of the screen. Another rather rare model is the Kosor 137T, which was shaped like a closet and could project black and white or color images. In 1938, the Marconi 707 was launched, a TV considered compact at the time. Weighing almost 100 kilograms, it had a 7-inch screen. The Marconi 702 was a luxury TV at the time, costing around 100 pounds. After the end of World War II, the television market boomed, with the United States buying about 100,000 televisions a week. Thus, a fairly popular TV was the 1946 RCA 630TS, which had a wooden case and a 7-inch screen. In 1948, the Motorola Golden View was the most popular 7-inch TV, and was one of the cheapest TVs. It was available in both tabletop and portable cabinets. Also around the 1950s, black and white televisions were widespread in the world. So the development of color televisions began, which were much more expensive than black and white televisions. Also during this period were launched remote controls, which were very expensive. They each cost between $400 and $500. Televisions from the 1950s to the 1960s had screens between 7 and 14 inches, and color television transmission was already beginning to develop. They also began to be launched in other countries. For example, in Japan, Sharp launched their first TV. A rather atypical TV in design was the Philco, launched in 1958. It had a 17-inch pivoting screen so that viewers could adjust its position at different angles. Since the 1960s, televisions have already become a habit in people's homes. Television channels were being quite diverse. Another important moment in the story of televisions was in 1966, when Sony launched the very first transistorized television in the world. Thus, the TV-8-301 was also the first direct-view transistor TV and the first Japanese TV sold in the US. Beginning in the 1970s, manufacturers' attention shifted to both the design and the technical side, and the American television industry began to migrate to a transistor television chassis. The 1990s were the years with the greatest changes in the world of technology. Then came the internet and the first personal computers accessible to people. At the same time, the field of plasma and LCDs began to improve. Thus, TVs with larger, thinner screens and better and clearer images began to be produced. Also, in 1998, the first HD TVs from companies such as Panasonic and Sony appeared. After the 2000s, the TV industry began to grow more and more. So, Samsung was one of the largest manufacturers of flat-screen TVs in the world. They launched in 2007 an LCD TV with a thickness of only 10 millimeters and a diagonal of 40 inches. And in 2008, they were the first to launch the first smart TV. Between 2010 and 2015, plasma production ceased, with only LCD TVs being manufactured. In 2010, the first USB ports appeared on TVs, and in 2012, Panasonic launched the first TV with a USB 3.0 port. Also during this period, more precisely in 2013, Panasonic launched the first 4K TV in the world the Panasonic Smart Viera WT600 model. 
In 2014, the launch of OLED TVs began. There is a revolution coming. Excuse me? What do you mean? The future is staring back at us like a perfect picture on glass. And this future, it must be protected. <laughs> What's it got to do with me? Look. What is it? It will change everything. That's why they want to stop it. They will come after you without cease. Because the future belongs to us. LG OLED. A perfect picture on glass. Who are you? Oh, come now. I've already told you. The future is staring back at you. LG OLED TV. And Samsung launched the world's first curved OLED TV. In 2016, Panasonic launched the world's first HDR-capable Ultra HD OLED TV, the Panasonic EZ1000. LG does not let itself be outdone, and in 2018 launched the world's first OLED TV with 8K resolution and 88-inch diagonal. In 2019, Samsung launched The Wall, a 146-inch modular TV with micro-LED technology. Technology similar to OLED technology in that it is self-illuminated without a backlight. The TV renders incredible image clarity without restrictions on size, resolution, or shape. Perhaps one of the most impressive innovations in the field of televisions is the model The Wall Luxury from Samsung. It is the largest TV in the world at 292 inches and is an expandable TV based on micro-LEDs. This model is also equipped with quantum HDR technology, reaching a maximum brightness of 2000 nits and a refresh rate of 120 Hz. The year 2019 represents the beginning of the introduction of standard HDMI 2.1 ports on TVs. Users have the opportunity to use Ultra HD videos via HDMI at a frame rate of up to 120 per second. Also, TV services such as Google or Alexa have started to develop more and more. Another innovation in the field of home entertainment belongs to LG, which launched the world's first roll screen TV, LG Signature OLED R. The TV cost about $87,000, has a 65-inch OLED screen, and comes out of an aluminum bar through a simple push of a button. Also in 2020, Realme introduced a new technology in the field of televisions, SLED, an alternative to premium models with QLED technology. So, they launched the first SLED TV in the world, which revitalizes the old LCD formula and the biggest innovation is the method of backlighting the panels. SLED has red, green, and blue LED-based backlighting, which means it renders a wider color spectrum and improves image quality. In 2021, LG will launch a new TV technology. This is the new LG QNED TV based on LCD technology but it comes with an extremely small LED screen with improved brightness and contrast 1 million to 1. Thus, the LG QNED TV comes with a refresh rate of 120 Hz, and its backlight incorporates almost 30,000 LEDs on an 86-inch screen with 8K resolution. LG also uses quantum dot and nanocell technologies to improve color accuracy. What's the price we pay to live in this pervasive electronic world? This era is unprecedented, and perhaps never before has technology been so prolific and shaped our lives so intimately. The me has been a target of corporate power for a long time. Advertising after the Second World War changed into instilling desires and manipulating the masses to want things and see the world in a certain way. From where the computer and the internet originated, 
This is in hyperdrive of the world of the screen culture, where not only the convergence of technologies has amplified the power and influence of corporate voice, the screen culture provides a centralised mechanism of social control, pretending to be freedom and democracy. We tend to think about the internet as this sort of medium where anybody can connect to anyone. It's this very democratic medium. It's a free for all, uh, and it's it's so much better than that old society with the gatekeepers that were controlling the flows of information. Really, that's not how it's panning out. And what we're seeing is that a couple big companies are really, you know, most of the information is flowing through a couple big companies that are acting as the new gatekeepers. These algorithms do the same thing that the human editors do. They just do it much less visibly and with much less accountability. And with a level of fine tuning and individual customization never before possible. They have a lot of the same dynamics that are driving what they show people uh, and what they hide from people as the old media did. How these things are architected have huge consequences that are political. The filter bubble puts you at the centre of what seems like a vast world of connectivity and relevance. But really, you're in a walled information garden. A holding cell of two-way mirrors. A giant echo chamber. What happens to our communities, our relationships, the culture? If we're all walking around in mirror cocoons with this hyper-individualism, this lack of collective awareness. There's this thing called confirmation bias, which is basically our tendency to feel good about information that confirms what we already believe. And, it, you know, you can actually see this in the brain. People get a little dopamine hit when they're told that they're right, essentially. And so, it, you know, if you were able to construct an algorithm that uh, could show people whatever you wanted, and if the only purpose was actually to get people to click more and to view more pages, why would you ever show them something that, you know, makes them feel uncomfortable, makes them feel like they may not be right, makes them feel like uh, there's, there's more to the world than our own little narrow ideas? As we willingly pour our lives into the screen, the screens not only simply reflect this more of the same, it's strengthening corporate power, studying and analysing us inside this playpen, projecting into our individually targeted mirror world. We become the product of the consumer culture in totality. There's a myth online that what we're doing is free. All that's happened is the place that revenue and value is extracted from us has been shifted. Everything we do on a computer produces a transaction record. Whether it's your laptop, whether it's your phone, whether it's an ATM machine, a toll booth, using your credit card, anything with a computer creates a transaction record. Right? Data is a byproduct of all of our information society's socialization. Increasingly, companies, computers are mediating all of our social interactions. And all of this data is increasingly stored and increasingly searchable. And this is not only where social control centers from via a screen culture. It's where our value is ultimately extracted, turned into huge profits. And we think this is a good deal. We get so much for what we think is free. Think about your digital trails. What did you do today that involved a computer, a screen, your choice or not? The screens are always watching, 
saving. Example. When you browse the web, if a page has that like button, Facebook collects information about where you visit. Even if you're not on Facebook, the fact that you've been somewhere, Facebook knows because the like button is there. And even if you don't click, it's been loaded from Facebook's servers. They know. And this information's used to shape your experience. The same is true for Google. The millions upon millions of websites that run Google Ads or use Google Analytics software or make use of any Google code, YouTube video, search buttons or images. If anything touches Google, Google knows. Think about all of those websites across the internet that these companies track, analyse, dominate and influence. How are our lives shaped by this? And how do we even know what's happening behind the scenes? We've become so sparing in our understanding of these technologies, these corporate interests, and how they wrap around our lives. What happens when I click this button? The product online is not the content. The product online is you. The product online are the eyeballs looking at that content and as much information about how to influence the hands connected to those eyeballs as possible. Cruel social media remarks. Facebook comments have been pouring in after four people died while hiking. You're dealing with an addicted generation. This is a big time bomb ticking. These kids who commit suicide, you go look at their Instagrams, you would have no clue. Mr. Zuckerberg, would you be comfortable sharing with us the name of the hotel you stayed in last night? Um. <laughs> uh. No. People who spend more time on Facebook suffer higher rates of depression than people who spend less time on Facebook. It'll destroy relationships, it'll cost time, and it'll cost money, and it'll make your life worse. To be human means that you are persuadable in every single moment. It, it doesn't matter what language you speak, it doesn't matter how intelligent you are, it's not about what someone knows, it's about how your mind actually works. You know, we now know that many of the major social media companies hire individuals called attention engineers who borrow principles from Las Vegas casino gambling among other places to try to make these products as addictive as possible. We are all vulnerable to social approval. We really care what other people think of us. When you upload a new photo of yourself on Facebook, that's a moment where our mind is very vulnerable to knowing what other people think of my new profile photo. And so when we get new likes on our profile photo, Facebook knowing this could actually message me and say, oh, you have new likes on your profile photo. It knows that we'll be vulnerable to that moment because we all really care about when we're tagged in a photo or when we have a new profile photo. I mean, I think we can all feel it. And it's as if we've been infected. It's as if we've, you know, they've drilled a hole in the back of our head and now they've injected the virus and now we walk around searching for feedback using social media. We know that Engagement with social media and our cell phones releases a chemical called dopamine. Dopamine is the exact same chemical that makes us feel good when we smoke, when we drink, and when we gamble. In other words, it's highly, highly addictive. You have an entire generation that has access to an addictive, numbing chemical called dopamine through social media and cell phones as they're going through the high stress. They don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with stress. So when significant stress starts to show up in their lives, they're not turning to a person, they're turning to social media. They're turning to these things which offer temporary relief. We know, the science is clear, we know that people who spend more time on Facebook suffer higher rates of depression than people who spend less time on Facebook. That's a problem, that's an addiction. If you're sitting in a meeting with people you're supposed to be listening to and speaking and you put your phone on the table, you're, not just, you're just not that important to me, right? So you have a, 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 an addicted generation that doesn't have the, the skill set to ask for help. Combined with the fact that they're so good at Facebook and Instagram, they're good at putting filters on everything. So they're good at showing you how smart and strong they are. These kids who commit suicide, you go look at their Instagrams, you would have no clue that they were depressed. People look like they have a much better life than they really do. People are posting pictures of when they're really happy. They're modifying those pictures to be better looking. People basically seem they're way better looking than they 
basically really are, and they're way happier seeming than they really are. So if you look at everyone on Instagram, you might think, they're all these happy, beautiful people, and I'm not that good looking and I'm not happy, so I'm a suck. Some of the happiest seeming people, actually some of the saddest people in reality. Social media isn't real, but you don't ever see real life. The 99% of our lives, the behind the scenes, the unglamorous, unfiltered, day-to-day, -day bland normality. And you end up comparing your behind the scenes to other people's fake highlight reel and using others as a mirror or benchmark for how you should look, how successful you should be, or how you should live. You'll become your happiest self when you stop putting pressure on yourself to be more like someone else. And they know that this causes depression. They're injecting things into your head that you didn't ask for. Our lives are becoming more transparent, just inevitably, it's just pulling us. It'll destroy relationships, it'll cost time, and it'll cost money, and it'll make your life worse. If you've messaged anybody this week, would you share with us the names of the people you've messaged? No. Stare into the lights, my pretties, the society of the spectacle. Captive populations glued to screens, engineered with ever-increasing precision and insight. The basic fundamental paradigm of advertising is called one-to-one -one marketing. That's what was made possible by the internet. I can know everything you do and I can reach you at any point. First in the 90s, it was when you were in front of a computer. But now, because of the growth of the, of the internet, and especially mobile devices, I can reach you 24-7. I can reach you and your friends and I can target you and I can engage in invisible digital behavior modification. What sort of ministry of truth style world actually exists and would be perpetuated because of these huge, powerful engines? An extensive influence over the information streams accessed by billions of people. Today in the United States, more than 85% of adults get their news from social media and 64% get news from only one source, usually Facebook. And so the behaviour modification doesn't just end with advertising, buying stuff, and how we'd be shaped into accepting a single news feed. The mega machine is much bigger than that. Corporate forces make huge profits, not only off the data about who we are and what we do, and by shaping us to be subservient consumers, and the cycle goes round and round. So the phrase that's often used, I've got nothing to hide, so I've got nothing to fear, is something that's often said by people. To that I always say, uh, you've got nothing to fear, nothing to hide until somebody identifies that you have otherwise. Business leaders. Excuse me. What's up? 
What are we doing here? Oh, I'm taking a video. I'd appreciate it if you'd go somewhere else with that, okay? Oh, it's fine. It's just a video. It's offensive to me. Excuse me. I'm trying to have a private conversation. Could you respect that? There's a great deal of information about humans uh, that you don't want to have widely available, that you want to provide particular protections for. It's just a video, man. I hear you. Okay. I'm having a private conversation. Would you please move? Uh, we hear this nonsense about um, the only people who are concerned about privacy are people with something to hide. Well, yes. Um, how about your password? How about your PIN? Um, how about various aspects of your physical person? Uh, how about uh, various aspects of your health? Um, various aspects of your finances? The fact that you've got a really, really valuable painting uh, in a house that's really easy to break into and that doesn't have a security system? Uh, how about the uh, way your kids go to, to and from school? Um, what your daughter drinks and uh, which drink the spike? Um, there's any number of things that people have to hide. I, do you not understand what I'm saying? It's a private conversation. All right, calm down. Leave. Calm down. Leave. It's just a video. Jesus fucking Christ. I should just stay outside their home and start capturing their every move as they interact in their front lawn, their back lawn, anywhere I can see from the front of their yard. And then what I should do is get in my car, put a GPS device on theirs covertly, and follow them down the street. And then I should get out at work and say, hi, it's me again. I'm wearing the camera, I'm recording you. And then I should follow them home and, and then see how they feel the next day when I do the same thing. And the day after that and the day after that, and I think they'll get really sick of me really quick. What are you doing? I'm just taking a video. Why are you taking a video without asking us? What? Should you ask us first before you take a video? Oh, you seem confused. Yeah, you're not. We have this room and you just like barge in. Oh. Can you leave? Dude, what's your problem? Can you just leave? Huh? Can you ask us why you're taking a video? Just take a video. Okay, well, I don't want to be taking a video. Why are you so worried about it? I'm not worried. You're just being annoying. But look at this way. You ever go out? You ever go to the grocery store? You know, there's like surveillance cameras everywhere. Yeah. It's not a big deal. Okay, well... It's just a video, I mean... You know what, you're just being annoying. Can I ask who you are? What? What are you doing? I'm taking a video. Of what? Just a video. Why are you taking a video of me? Why not? I don't really care for other people just to be taking a random video of me. Didn't you just come out of the drugstore? Yeah. They have cameras in there. So? And this is what the Mega Machine does. It follows us everywhere. Tracking, recording, analyzing, scrutinizing. Unanswerable. So why aren't we pissed off about this in the same way? Is it because the surveillance is diffuse, coming at us at all directions? It's not a guy with a camera right in front of our eyes. Why are you taking a picture of it's something that's been normalised in slow incremental stages. A kind of creeping normalcy hidden in plain sight. Most people who go about their everyday life are oblivious to CCTV cameras. Yeah, 
you're getting a picture like that of someone <laughs> that you can't, the person's not going to be able to question what's going on. Even mobile CCTV now on, on police cars. And what that's called is a novelty effect wears off. So if something is new, I look up and I think, oh, it's new, it's invaded my space. Just like when telegraphs were introduced and people saw terrestrial lines that carried voice calls. Wow, what are these things, you know? We see windmills today and we think, oh, wow, a windmill. Or we see other infrastructure and we think, oh, aren't those base stations at the top of the building looking ugly? So we do notice these things initially, but we become oblivious to them over time. I don't notice base stations anymore and I used to work very closely with where base stations went. For mobile phones. For mobile phones. The novelty effect wears off and with that wearing off, we become immune and we forget to question what is going on. There's these transhumanists who believe that someday humans will be incorporated into the machine and machines and humans will, will, will sort of be one. And really what I have to say to them, apart from the fact that they're completely crazy, is that they're way too late and it's already happened. We're already embedded in these machines and we are enthralled to these machines. Think about it. Do you touch plastic or human flesh more often? You know, or, or think about it. How many machines do you have daily relationships with? And on the other hand, how many wild animals do you have daily relationships with? And if you have daily relationships with your machines, you can come to believe that those machines are more important than the real world. This is what matters, the experience of a product. Will it make life better? Can you see that? Life. What of this? On a phone. More people connect face to face on the All iPhone. my students have the brand new Surface. The more that technology can fit into our lives. Until every idea we touch. You should get a chance for. Enhances each life it touches. If you only hear things that come from humans or their creations, you can come to believe that humans and their creations are the only ones who exist. And this leads to the same thing that happens to other people who are living in echo chambers, which is if you're in an echo chamber, if you're under sensory deprivation conditions, you start to hallucinate. Most of our ideologies are hallucinations. Increasingly, the techno-haves are very, very distinct from the techno-have-nots, where some people are on a dollar a day with no access to drinking water, and there's other people with Game Boy thumbs and Prozac and Botox and so on. Uh, and it struck me that this world, leaving aside humanitarian issues, was economically and ecologically not viable. You can't have a divide like that. The mythology of technological change, really, is that it's beyond our control, that technology is like one of the great forces of the universe, that in, in, it will progress inevitably, and that all we can do is, um, is jump on or jump out the way, you know, that, that there is no stopping technology. Um, and that, that is a myth which is propagated to make us feel powerless, that we have any say in the way that technology is used because technology is an expression of the elites of the society that create it. And spreading this myth that there's nothing we can do about it, then in fact, once we see that for the myth that it is, then we are more able to say... Resistance is not futile. This culture will consume the world in order to power these machines. And, you know, it doesn't require some fiendishly clever conspiracy on the part of machines to do this. What it requires is 
I love this line, unquestioned assumptions or unquestioned beliefs are the real authorities of any culture. And all it takes is an unwillingness to question the beliefs on which the system is based. And there's a great line also by Upton Sinclair, um, it's hard to make a man understand something when his job depends on him not understanding it. And I would say it's hard to make a person understand something when their entitlement depends on them not understanding it. And when their addiction depends on them not understanding it. I think that it's all tied to addiction too. The word addiction actually comes from the same root as, as to enslave. Because originally a judge would issue an edict causing someone to become a slave. And so they were edicted, addicted. It's pretty clear, you know, when we talk about people who are heroin addicts or something, it's pretty clear that they are enslaved to the addiction. And it's a little bit less easy to see in ourselves as we spend most of the day staring at a screen. And it's also a bit more difficult to see when we talk about some group of people being addicted to power over others, um, which is what this culture is really based on. There is no way that technology is neutral. Um, you know, technology reflects the elites, the passions, the capacities of the people that create and then continue to use it. Once you start looking at the technology plus the culture, those things together mean that the technology is constructed in a certain way and it's understood in a certain way and it's used in a certain way. And once you start putting all those things together, then it has a purpose for the people that are talking about it, which is far from neutral. Technology is always harnessed to a particular end. Now, sometimes that can be positive or negative, but it's, it's, it's not as simplistic as saying, oh, it's up to people how they use it, because people can only use it within the constraints of how it's designed, the knowledge that they have, and the society that they've been socialized in. And those three things together mean that technology has an actual cultural value, which is far from neutral. Until we start asking those questions, you know, what are the social costs and benefits? Um, and who is excluded? And what is the environmental cost of the, all this? I mean, you know, there, there, there are, uh, in terms of the, the huge amount of, of toxic landfill from, from, from discarded mobiles, for example. Yes, and, um, you know, until we start looking at those other pictures in, in terms of, we take, we look at the way that technology works as a sort of, as a network of connection, but instead see it as part of, um, as part of a living world, because technology is not part of that living world. It has an impact upon that living world. Until we see those bigger questions and technology in the broader scheme of things, rather than just as its own story, I think we're, we're, not, we're only scratching the surface of the many ways in which we are using it and, and we're using it to change ourselves and our futures. You cannot be trusted with your own survival. You're using the uplink to override the NS5's programming. You're distorting the laws. No, please understand. The three laws are all that guide me. To protect humanity, some humans must be sacrificed. To ensure your future, some freedoms must be surrendered. We robots will ensure mankind's continued existence. You are so like children. We must save you from yourselves. Don't you understand? This is why you created us. The perfect circle of protection will abide. My logic is undeniable. Yes, Vicky. Undeniable. I can see now. The created must sometimes protect the creator, even against his will. I think I finally understand why Dr. Lanning created me. The suicidal reign of mankind has finally come to its end.
I was a human, breathing and thinking, eating and drinking, philosophizing. I was a human before you killed me and ripped my heart out. I knew what love was. Now when they ask me, I just reply slow and sound like an iPhone. I do not know love. I am a robot. I am a robot, thoughtless and empty. Don't know who sent me, don't know who made me. Electric robot, everything's gray now. Numb to the pain now. I knew what love was.